So tonight we're going to talk about the turtle trading system. So uh, a system that's quite popular back in the uh, the kind of mid to late 80s. And it just goes to show and reinforce, I guess, you know, why it's very important to have a strategy, have a plan, have an idea of what you're trying to achieve. Because really, when it comes down to trading, the most difficult part of being um, a successful trader is being consistent. It's having something you can do time in, time out that makes you the money. It's not that one big trade or that one event that should make you, uh, you know, a, a good trader. It's about being in the markets in a controlled manner over a consistent period of time. That's what really makes you know, great traders. And the total trading system was part of, I guess, proving you can teach anybody to trade. So before I start, as always, the risk warning: remember that spread betting and safety trading both carry high risk or capital the possibility of losing more than initial investment. These investments might be returned for all investors only 10 for people of the age of 18. Please ensure you fully aware of the risks involved and necessary. Seek independent financial advice. Education only. Contact the webinars personal opinion of the moderator, not intro.com. The content does not constitute financial investment or tax advice. We recommend that you discuss your specific requirement with an independent financial advisor prior to entering any bet. Intro.com does not accept any liability for the content comes with during this session. So who are the turtles and why is the turtle trading experiment? Well, it all about boils down to a simpler simpler place in time, I guess. And the men behind it were two guys, Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart. And uh, Richard was a very famous commodity trader back in the 90s. And together with his friend Bill, they came up with this idea they could teach anybody to trade. So very much like the, uh, the kind of Eddie Murphy film, The Trading Places, the idea is that if anybody is given a set formula, a set set of rules, they can be successful traders. And... To a large extent, I guess I believe that for a long time. I've taught, I mean, literally too many people to count how to trade. But unfortunately for me, I find that everyone's different. If you give them enough money, enough money, enough time, enough scope, enough ability to, to, to lose, then people will be successful traders in the long run. But the markets are so complex now and so complicated, so crowded. This idea really doesn't exist for me anymore. But it's still a good illustration of... A, how times change, and B, how the trading mentality, when you do have a sufficient amount of capital, can be utilized to make money. So why were they called turtles? Well, it's a bit of a, again, a 90s kind of, you know, Richard Branson slash, you know, right person at the right time trying to think, you know, Richard had come back from a holiday in uh, Singapore, and he'd seen how they'd grown turtles. So he wants to grow traders like they grow turtles in Singapore. So, again, you know, just a sign of the times how backwards, you know, things were only, you know, kind of 25 years ago. The basic premise was that anyone can follow rules. Anybody can follow rules. We follow rules in life. We follow rules in anything we do. So if you can get these rules, trade them with any kind of confidence, okay, then you're going to be a better tr a trader. It's nature versus nurture. Obviously, that you know, people aren't born bad. People people aren't necessarily born as great traders. They can be taught. <clears throat> was again a you know very important premise that given the right situation, surroundings, you know, the right kind of I don't know, the, the, the right kind of environment, I guess, and the right kind of support so that anybody can be a good trader. And it, again it was proved to a certain extent that this could be true. But again the markets are very different back then, you know, there's very there was no Facebook, no internet, you know, as such, there was no kind of freedom of information. You know, back in the 90s, the trading world was, you know, back for a, you know, a glorified few, you know, people that could understand the markets and put the money behind it. So back in the 90s, again, as I said, you know, the world was a very different place. Internet was not so instrumental and, you know, people weren't as free to learn. As they are now, people have the freedom of information in so many respects. If you want to change a battery in your car, YouTube it. If you want to find out what the capital of, I don't know, Botswana is, you Google it. You know, that's a part of our language. If you want to find how to do something now, you Google it. That's how you find out information. Back, you know, in the 90s, that wasn't the case. You had to find information from people, real people, so people still held power. I guess the experiment came up with, you know, that they were responsible for teaching traders. They funded each trader between half a million and two million dollars. And even in, in these days, that's huge sums of money. I mean, back in the 90s, it was colossal money. Now, not so much money, but if you're trading with a $2 million account, you have options. They protected traders by teaching them their system, and only people that were involved in their system knew the IP, knew the system. So, you know, back then, a 1,000 people applied. Uh, they uh, interviewed 80 people. Uh, 10 traders uh, were made from that, and then three, including the friends. You think about, you know, if somebody came to the market now, and said, we're going to give you a half million to two million dollar account, 
and you know think about how many people applied. It won't be thousands. It'd be tens of thousands. It'd be hundreds of thousands of people. Probably millions of people. Literally, that's how much the world has changed. IP is definitely intellectual property is definitely a thing that is a free for all these days. It's not as how the world used to be. If you knew something back then, you keep it secret. You keep it under your heart. You could, you know, churn it, use it to your advantage. And now IP. It's not about IP anymore. It's about the brand. It's about you know its potential. Can you IPO it? You know the, the, the same emphasis on information just isn't the same anymore. Information is cheap. Okay, power is king. Information is cheap. So what they're looking for is to give traders a complete trading system. So the total trading system was basically something that covered every aspect of trading. There was no decision that the trader couldn't make. Now today we have EAs, algorithms, black boxes, grey boxes. You can program a computer to do anything a human can. And that's basically can trade news, it can trade certain amounts of movement, it can do things better than a human. I don't think we're at the stage now where computers actually take over humans just yet, but it might be the case in the future where humans just, you know, just are not needed in the trading world. Again, I think that's all down to the power aspect. The thing, you know, the, the people that, tr you know, trade the markets and control these algorithms also have people, they have funds, they have teams of people. At the end of the day, you know, people make the world go around. And all this idea, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that, you know, computers are going to take over the world and take over our jobs, I guess they might do, you know, to a certain extent for the kind of really basic manual things. We talk about taxi drivers or, you know, transport lorries. I mean, all these things to have a human being behind the wheel seem a little bit archaic. And that will change. At the end of the day, making decisions, making the world go around, that's always going to be down to people because people control the technology. And there won't be a point in time, in my opinion, where computers actually rule the world. Because what's the point? You know, uh, any human being that kind of made any legislation or any kind of idea that could, you know, be a workable solution, you know, it, it has that basic, you know, survival instinct, that kind of premise that, you know, we've evolved to the top of the food chain. Why would you then create something that could beat you? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't make any sense. So for me, I don't really see a point in time where human beings are replaced by machines, but I do see a point in time where a lot of useless human beings, which there are plenty, you know, look at the public sector, look at MPs, uh, you know, that are replaced by machines. And is the world ready for that? I don't know. I really don't know. It depends how the world wants to be and how people want to be. It's more of a social thing, an economic thing. Of course, machines can do things more efficient, faster, and better, but more machines, if the corporations aren't paying the, you know, the equivalent tax, means the whole thing falls down. So let's not be disillusioned or be under any illusion that human beings are going to be uh, replaced anytime soon. Human beings are cash cows. They're proven to uh, be able to work as hard as they can and make the government's money. And while they're still in charge, then the same as the stock market. While there's people involved in the markets and everyone's making money, we're all happy. We can't have one person making all the money because then it doesn't work. We need lots of people to making lots of money and losing lots of money. And that's what keeps the financial markets ticking. Everybody's got a chance to make something. Okay, It can't be a one-sided um, you know, game because if it is, then the whole thing falls down. You don't have financial advisors. You don't have people writing news articles. The one system was so clever... <clears throat> that it, you know, took on the markets and always won, then, again, all the power will be one-sided. And that's not how the world works. So I guess the components of this system, the total training system, was that it's based upon six overall components that we all know about. The markets, positions, entry points, stops, exit points, and tactics. So what the markets were the markets. What do you trade and why? Okay, Back in the 90s, a lot of commodities. There's no way you'd be able to trade gold the way you did back in the 90s. No way. Impossible. You couldn't take the size, you couldn't take the movement, you couldn't take the positions. So that again is an idea how things have changed. But you all know markets that we trade. We make money in it, we lose money in it. Positions. What size you trade? Very simple. Entry point, where you buy and sell. Stop, when you're wrong. Exit point, where you get your profit out. Tactics, how you buy and sell. Any trader of any ability goes through these six points. So it's no different for the total traders. So the markets. I guess the first decision is what products do you need to trade or why? Should you trade the markets? You do. If you trade too few markets, you're not getting enough trends. If you overtrade, trading too many markets, you get caught out by 
volatility, you get caught out by you know things that are going against you. At the end of the day, you can only trade so much. One person can only do so much. That's why people like machines, because machines can trade many things simultaneously, because that's what computers are built for, to be faster, quicker, to be better. So again, the, the principles of the total trading system were, again, all the same. What they were trying to do is give people a set of rules, let them have a minimal amount of interpretation, and then get on board. Right. So again, what it was important was giving people boundaries, giving people ideas of what they could or couldn't achieve. So the markets are things we've all heard of. You know, things back in the day were all split to exchanges. So you had the CBOT, Chicago Board of Trade, you know, which was 30-year Treasury bonds, you know, 10-year notes, T notes as we call them. And then you had the New York uh, Coffee Exchange, you know, for things like uh, you know commodities. And this again shows you how the markets change. You now trade through your spread betting platform and you trade everything under one place. Back in the day, you had to have different licenses, you know, different permissions to trade different products, different leverage, different abilities of different, you know, market keys. And now all these things are in one place. You can trade anything you want whenever you want. So again, you know, things like Comex was, you know, all the uh, commodities like silver, gold and copper, you know, the New York Mercantile Exchange was all your, your oil. And these days, really, anybody can trade literally literally wherever they want in one place and that's the difference again between the ip you know if you want to trade you can do whatever you want under one umbrella in modern times back then you had to split it apart so again it's that power that control so the markets today are very different i mean intertrader you can trade anything you want futures quarterlies rolling contracts any product you want to trade you can trade it under one umbrella under one place okay again going back to you know anything you want from oil, gold, silver, any individual share. You can look at anything that moves at any time and you can trade it. I guess the market rates tell you, you know, what is easy to trade. I guess easy is the wrong word. You know, what's seen or perceived to be, you know, kind of volatile or difficult. And that, again, is you're looking at the, the spreads. So, you know, the spreads on things like the FTSE, again, the initial margin of 30, um, you know, dollars per point, and the spread is 1. But, you know, things like uh, silver, for instance, gold, Brent, 5. Now, these are old, old figures because this is, you know, uh, a very old presentation. But, again, it understands or lets you understand, you know, what the, the, the spread betting companies are trying to provide. If they say some things, you know, a one-tick spread, they know that relatively it won't move really that far. On the other hand, you know, things like gold, silver, or oil are, you know, much higher, you know, five times the amount of initial margin and, and spread because it's much more difficult to predict what's going to happen. So, again, understanding volatility, daily ranges, how things move it is part and parcel of being a trader. And the total traders knew this. So, they set their parameters for their traders, for the risk perspective, what they could buy in size, what they could buy and sell, you know, the volume they could trade, based on these things like spreads and margin. So they're giving somebody half a million pound account, they know exactly you know, what they can trade against, you know, how much they can put in the market, how much they can take out. And that is just the same as a spread betting company. They know if you put a thousand pounds in your account, your likelihood of making money as a trader is X amount. If you put 20,000 pounds in an account, they know there's a different level of what you can do. So position and sizing, the position for the total traders was quite intelligent. And this is where they really had their, their, their unique IP. What they did is this whole formula. And you'll know, bear with me, you know, this isn't my kind of my strategy, but it kind of basically shows that the IP back then was obvious to us now, but quite groundbreaking at the time. So what they did is they adjusted their position based upon the dollar volatility. So what they call this volatility was N. So N represents the 20 day exponential moving average of the actual true range. OK, so things we take for granted now, but it didn't exist in the same way back then. So N represents the average price movement of a particular market on a particular day. OK, sounds complicated. It's going to get a little bit complicated here, but it's actually not. So what we're trying to find out is what is the true range? So the true range is the maximum high minus low, high minus previous day's close, previous day's close minus the low. So we're trying to figure out essentially is what is the volatility? How far can the average product that the, these traders are looking at move in a day? If you understand how much it will move, you can understand your risk. Something will move 50 ticks in a day. It's going to go down 50 ticks, up 50 ticks. You know how much risk you can take based upon what you know. 
So they're trying to compute the N, yeah, which is the volatility, and that's N equals 19 times previous day's N plus true range over 20. So essentially what you're trying to find is the average trading range over a 20-day period. That essentially is what they're trying to find. And they position themselves based upon what's happened over the last 20 days, how far a market can potentially move, therefore how much they can risk. So again, quite complex in some respects, but pretty simple now. If you look over the trading range of the FTSE over the last 20 days, we can see a trading average. I mean, you're moving average over the last 20 days. You can see the highs and the low. You can understand how many ticks, how many pips a market's moved between the high and the low each day divided by 20. And you know if you're 20 ticks offside and you're buying the FTSE, it might be able to go another 30. It might be able to go another 40, 50 whatever but you know averagely how far that market moves so pretty simple when you think about it but it's quite cutting edge and unique at the time what they're trying to do is again you know reinvent trading for, for back in the time so the true range you know the average trading range these things we click a button and we understand it you know we can have that on our screens in, a, in, in, in an instant but what these guys are trying to understand is that you've got the current high, previous close. So you're looking for the true range, as in where the markets actually found value. So they're trying to get out the tails, trying to get out the, the stock grabbers, you know, the pin bars. They're looking for the body of the candles in relation to how far our markets moved and see what the true range is. You know, what the market's actually trying to achieve. And I'll tell you what, if I was trading 25 years ago, <laughs> I had a clean up too. Because I totally understand the idea of a true range and what a fake out, breakout, and all these things are. And that's why these things have come into the market, the fake out, breakouts, because other people want to benefit from knowing what you know. Back then, nobody knew anything. So the total traders understood that and built a strategy that could make them money. These days, everybody knows how everybody trades. So the big guys try and fake out, breakout markets so they can make the extra money. This is how the total trading system will never survive in modern days. So again, these calculations are made on commodities and again, are susceptible to market gap. So th that's what was really important to the total traders is that extra volume, volatility, unknown news was categorized as a gap. Now, we still see gaps in the markets now, but they're not anywhere near as prevalent as they were back in the 90s. So again, we can look at the markets in the same way these days, with, you know, pivot points, Bollinger Bands, other technical you know, kind of factors that really just destroy what these guys thought about in a heartbeat. So the modern markets are just so much more transparent and the availability of information. You know, you can download anything of MT4, anything you can think to trade an MT4. You can have somebody program it for a few hundred dollars. So any scenario, these guys weren't doing that and paying the guys a few hundred dollars. They were actually making people adhere to rules that they knew if you did for a long enough period of time would win. So again, they're playing the, the longer game. They're just creating people to follow rules. These days, people are expensive. They let you down. They're volatile. Whereas computer programs, they're less volatile and you control them. So that's why the rise of computers has, has really had a real big grip on the markets. So the importance of sizing and positioning was, again, if you diversify trading products, you're spreading your risk. I mean, that's pretty simple. If you're trading things that are very closely correlated, uh, you know, uh, moving the same with different markets, you can be overexposed. So if you're trading gold, silver, and, I don't know, platinum in the same kind of basket of trades, they're essentially going to move in the overall direction. So you're not hedged off against the dollar, which they're all priced in, or if you're just buying them all, then you're going to get no diversity. So they knew that. So if you're trading a single market, max four lots, closely correlated six, loosely 10, single direction 12. So you have more volatility, more size on things that aren't dependent on other things. Because if you trade things that are very closely correlated and lots of them, then you're doubling up. So again, they knew this. Simple rule, but again, back in the day that a lot of traders didn't think this way. And that's why this total trading system was kind of, you know, fairly unique. So they had two kind of main systems for entry, and they're all, I mean, again, you could look at these things and literally laugh out loud at them. You know, they're, they're quite basic. The first one was a short-term system based on a 20-day breakout, and the second one was a simple system based on a 55-day breakout. These are moving averages, a 20-day and 50-day moving average. I mean, it doesn't get much more basic than that for your entry point, does it? So what are looking for is a system around breakouts. So it's easy to spot a breakout. You know, when you're highly above or below a moving average, that is classed as a breakout. 
so we understand how to get into a trade when things have broken out. So supporting indicators these days, you know, such as trend lines, resistance, channels, make trading a little bit more, not complex, but they make it a bit more of a battlefield because everybody knows what everyone else is looking at. So it's picking the right indicators at the right time. These guys weren't doing that. They were picking their entry based upon essentially one indicator, a moving average, which seems almost laughable these days. So what we're looking for is a system that gets into a trade based on a 20-day uh, moving average or a 55-day moving average, and you buy and you sell above and below these regions, and your stops are based upon that moving average and that calculation that they made, the average trading range. So if you're 20, 30 ticks above a moving average, then you're probably wrong. Okay, It isn't a breakout. You have to get out, and that's your loss. Now, there's an old saying in trading, there are old traders, there are bold traders, but there are no old bold traders. And that just means that the guys that take it easy, plod along, don't get too stressed out, generally make the most money. If you're in the market trying to make a million pounds a day, and you full out, you flat out every trade, then the chances are probably against you. So what we're trying to figure out is, you know, for these traders, is where you're wrong, you know, where you can take an acceptable loss, and do the system over and over again, and then end up making money. You're in the markets, you make a profit. In the markets, you make a loss. But if you do that enough times, in and out of the markets, you'll make money in the long term. And that's what the traders, the turtle traders, are trying to instill in their traders. If you follow the plan for long enough, with enough capital, you'll make money. So the turtle traders would generally, you know, trading quite large positions. And they don't want to reveal them, you know, to kind of brokers. And again, it's back when brokers had a lot of control over the markets. So they didn't put stops with brokers or in the markets. What they did is they understood that, you know, they're trading a million pound account. If you're 20,000 pounds offside, you know, then you take your 2% risk. And again, they worked that out for the traders as this N, this volatility. You're trading X amount of size in a market that moves X amount of ticks a day. If your X amount of money equals ticks offside in a position, you're probably wrong to get out. So just like a risk or ratio that I teach you, you know, two to one, five to one, whatever. That is the whole point. So, I mean, again, you think about the volatility, you know, if you're two times the volatility of the average move of the market over the last 20, you know, periods, you're probably wrong. So, again, they can move their stops around percentages of N, this volatility. But if you're trading a market that generally over the last 20 days trades 100 ticks, it suddenly moved 200 ticks, so 100 times the volatility, you are wrong. Not that you're wrong on the trade, but at that time, that point in time, you are wrong. And that's what the traders do. Yeah, they try to make you think you're wrong these days, but back in the day of the total training strategy, they were just trying to make you understand that markets moved in a volatile way to a certain respect, but they went up or down on average at a certain amount, so you could trade with a certain amount of risk, a certain amount of size, and make a certain amount of money if you did things in an orderly way. And that's it. So I guess, you know, again, the, the, the traders... Understood the markets were complex and, you know, again, still very difficult. You know, it's never easy to trade. But you could do, instead of using your entire stop as 2% of your account, stops are placed at half a percent of the risk. So you could build up positions. And that's what I teach you. That's called averaging. So you buy and sell up and down the range and you average out your risk based upon the movement in a smaller amount. So instead of trading 20 lots, you know, with 2% risk, you trade 5 lots a quarter percent risk and you build up that 20 percent and spread your two percent risk out over a longer period of time and again you know the the, the total risk never exceeded two percent and that's very similar to today's rules of risk and then the exit again it was all about the opposite so if you're in a trade for a 20 period moving average or a 55 period moving average to get out it was a 10 day low or a 10 day high or for the, the system too it was a 20 day high or low i mean it sounds so basic it's actually cringing well, this is how traders work. The tactics basically were buy to strength, sell to weakness. What does that sound like? Buy low, sell high? Hmm. Have we heard that before? Of course we have. Beware of rolling over contracts. Understand the rules. Trading's about being prepared. Don't wing it. You know, don't be caught off guard. And my God, these are the things that I've taught people for the last six years in Intertrader. You know, follow the basics, do them well, and the rest will take care of itself. But back in the day, this was all revolutionary. 
All right, guys, any thoughts or questions? Again, I mean, the total trading thing never goes out of fashion because it's people following rules. However, we can't wind back the clock and make everybody trade like the 1990s where money was, you know, all over the place. There was loads of, you know, IP that was quality you keep for yourself. But, you know, again, these things change. The idea behind the total trading system is that if people follow the rules, they will be better people, better traders because they had something to refer to. And that's all about my Trade for Life course, all about my Art of Trading course. Follow the rules and you'll be better for it. All right, guys, any, any thoughts, any questions, anything you'd like to ask? I know it's a bank holiday coming up, so I don't want to keep people for, uh, for too long. No, no questions, guys, no thoughts. I guess the overall message, you know, from this webinar is that times change, but traders don't. If you have a plan, you stick to it, you have an idea of what you're going to do, then essentially it's going to be better for you in the long term. All right, guys, well, listen, any more questions, you know how to get me on uh, on. Uh, Steve Ruffley, uh, sorry, S. Ruffley at TradingMarket.com. You can get me at S. Ruffley uh, on Twitter. You know, again, it's not a difficult person to find. So uh, anything you want to ask me, you can ask me in private. But at the end of the day, again, understand that trading with a rule, uh, defined goal and parameters is always easier than just uh, turning up and, and trading. All right, guys, well, listen, been an absolute pleasure. Anything else you want to get a hold of me, have a great night. Enjoy the bank holiday. We do have a live trade tomorrow for the uh, GDP, so join me at 1 o'clock for that. Anything else you want to, uh, to contact me. All right, guys, thank you. Have a great night. Cheers.